Praise the Lord, church. I got two praise the Lords. Praise the Lord, church. Are you glad to be in the house tonight? I'm thankful to be here. Could you stand? Let's open with prayer. Ask that God's presence to be here, which I know he's already here. But let's let him know that we want him to be in here and moving. Jesus, so thankful for this night. So thankful for this service. So thankful for an opportunity to once again come into the house to lift our hands, our hearts, and our voices in appreciation and thankfulness to who you are and what you've done. I pray, God, this service under your authority. I pray your direction. I pray your anointing. I pray your will into every life as we honor you and praise your name. Be with us tonight as we come into the house as we lift our hearts and praise you tonight for you alone are worthy this night Jesus we give you praise in Jesus name in Jesus name amen you may be seated come into this house magnify the Lord lift up holy hands our hearts in one accord for he's worthy Worthy of all our praise. Yes, he's worthy. He's worthy of all our praise. Come into this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for he's worthy. Worthy of all our praise. Yes, he's worthy. He's worthy of all our praise. Worthy of honor and glory. Worthy of power and praise. Worship and to my Lord. If you could stand, we're going to go to him in prayer. Have many needs tonight. I want to remember Jim, the uncle of Kayleen Etheridge with COVID, Brett also with COVID, Ashley also with COVID. I want to pray for Jim Roberts, had a seizure, needs a touch from God. Tom Ewing also needs a healing touch, as does Sister Kayleen Etheridge. Jim Thompson had emergency surgery, has pneumonia, needs God to touch him. We also want to lift up the Buller family. Brother Buller, as many of you know, passed away, a faithful man, God, gone to his reward, but 
there is a church hurting and a family that's hurting from that loss. So pray for the Buller family. Pray for Don Cox. He's got cancer and needs a touch from God. And Porter Souders, a 10-year-old that doctors are trying to remove a brain tumor, had issues, couldn't get it. When it's a child, I don't know why we think it's any worse, but for some reason it touches the heart. So pray for this family. Pray for Shane Gibbons, also has COVID, and Kim Lease is in need of a touch from God. I had a request from Sister Mary Niece. Her body is still in a lot of pain, asking that God would minister to her. I'm so thankful I've got an all-knowing God. You know? So thankful. You got an unknown need. You can just raise the hand. And he knows. He knows. He knows. Let's go to him in prayer tonight. Father, we're lifting our hands, our hearts, and our voices tonight. These names that have been mentioned. God, we're asking, Lord, healing touch. We're asking for comforting touch. We're asking for deliverance. We're asking for liberation. We're asking, God, that your authority into every circumstance, every situation. God, every unspoken need just represented by a hand or an individual in the house tonight. I'm praying your authority into that life. I'm praying your will into that situation. God, move and be the awesome God that we know you are. God, touch that there would be a report. There would be a testimony of your authority. Move, Lord, every life, every heart, every mind, every spirit. Into your will we give it. Into your will we place it. Let your will be done. Oh, let your will be accomplished to your glory, to your honor, to your worship. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Lord bless you. You may be seated. <coughs> if you bought some butter braids from the young people, your money is due today. So please turn your money in to Brother Rex. He will take care of that. Next Friday is our fall weekend outreach. Friday night we'll have a prayer service at 6.30. It's for the whole church. Following the prayer service, Sunday school is asking for volunteers to help set up for the party which is going to happen then on Saturday the 16th at 3 p.m. Sign up sheet in the entryway if you're able to help with the activities for the party. And then that Sunday we're having special services with our evangelists. So the whole weekend you got a chance to be with people of like precious faith. Come together, but also so we can reach to our community to let them know the good news, the mercy of God. And then we have Trunk or Treat coming up at the end of the month. Don't forget that. The kiddies always enjoyed that. If our ushers would come tonight, we're going to take up an offering. Jesus so thankful, God, that we know who you are, that we can come into this house to worship you, to pray to you, knowing that you're the all-knowing God. We're asking your blessings upon this offering tonight. Bless those who are giving, God, out of a thankful gratitude heart. Touch and anoint them. Be the Jehovah Jireh into their lives, we pray. Everything into your hand, we ask in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, fuck. 
clap our hands all across this place. If you're thankful to know that when you go through the fire, He's with you. If you're thankful to know when you go through the water, you won't be overtaken. Let there be a shout of praise in this place because I know that He is there even when I don't see Him, He's there. Even when I don't feel Him, He's there. Is there anybody that can testify to the goodness of Jesus in this place? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Amen, amen, amen. How many is excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight? I know we got quite a few people traveling and and all that stuff, so we want the Lord to be with them. But I just want you guys to know I got one speed. So whether I'm preaching to 10 people or 100 people, you just got what you got. Is that okay? So we're going to pretend like this place is full and just have some church. Is that all right? All right. All right. Psalm 106, starting in verse 13. And I just have to say, happy fall, y'all. How many love autumn? How many love the fall? It's my favorite time of year. I'm convinced, I'm convinced, Elder, that heaven will be 55 degrees. You're going to need a hoodie. It's going to smell like pumpkin spice. There's going to be a bonfire. I, I, I don't know where I got that theology, but I'm sticking to it. Is that okay? All right. Praise the Lord. Is it all right to have fun? Can we just, do, can we just have fun tonight? All right. Praise the Lord. Verse 13. But they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent a wasting disease among them. When men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the company of Abarim. Fire also broke out in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image. Verse 20. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Verse, verse 21 again. They forgot God, their Savior. I, I want to preach tonight. I, I feel like this is for somebody, okay? With the help of the Holy Ghost, I want to preach this subject. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Is that okay? Can we do that tonight? We're going to go before the Lord in prayer, but before we do, I want to make a special mention that Brett Millette has passed away. Uh, I know they requested prayer for him. I don't think it made it quite through. He did pass away, so I believe he was 30 years old due to, due to COVID complications, so we want the Lord to be with his family. He's got a precious little girl. He's got parents and family and friends that love him very much, so we want um, the peace of God to be with them during this time. Also, I want to make special mention of uh, a distant relative of mine, Ashley Lanigan. Uh, she is also um, in the hospital on a ventilator due to COVID. Um, she's actually had several strokes now, so things are getting, um, getting kind of crazy. And uh, see, the enemy wants you to think that because God didn't heal one, he can't heal the other. But I think it kind of lines up with what I'm going to preach tonight because I refuse to let the prayers he doesn't answer the way I want cause me to forget the prayers that he has. I refuse. So why don't we go before the Lord in prayer tonight as we prepare. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We're asking right now that you would be with the family of Brett tonight. 
Lord, that you would sweep in their home even now and allow them to feel an unexplainable peace that surpasses all comprehension. I'm asking that you would be with that family as they deal with this tragedy and learn to live with the grief and the hole in their heart, God. I pray, Jesus, that through it all, they would see you there in the midst. Even, even when it feels like you've abandoned them, I pray that they would see and feel your presence tonight. I'm also praying for Ashley Lanigan in the name of Jesus. I pray that healing virtue would flow. God, that it would go to her hospital room even now and you would begin to move from the top of her head to the sole of her feet, Jesus, that there would be a ministering spirit there, God, that the doctors would know that it was nothing they did, but it was only by the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray for healing and restoration and peace in the name of Jesus. I pray for this message tonight that it would go forth and not return void, but that you would accomplish whatsoever you desire to accomplish in this place. We come expecting great things in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus. If you're looking forward to what God wants to do, would you give him one more hand clap of praise tonight in Jesus' name? You can be seated in Jesus' name. You know, I, I have never actually been diagnosed with any sort of attention deficit disorder. But for those of you who really know me, perhaps many of you tonight, it's not jumping to too far of a conclusion to suggest that I probably have a touch, Brother Bobby, of ADHD. Certainly every elementary school teacher would affirm this statement as my difficulties with sitting still sitting down and getting up and ending up across the classroom uh, would testify. The problem is it didn't end in adolescence because my need to constantly move continues to exist with me, which is why I always have to shake a leg or beat my fingers on a table. And it's also the reason why my wife can never have the living room of her dreams because we will always have a rocking chair. Always. And I want to share a story with you that I feel exemplifies my struggle. Because one Saturday several years back while Diana was out of town, I sat in the living room and I was just kind of hanging out and started getting a little antsy. Okay? And so I, I was going to make something to eat. But before I did, I kind of got sidetracked and I decided that I, I had this bright idea that I was going to start cleaning and organizing my apartment. Now, Diana will uh, attest to this, that this is not my area of expertise. I, I do a much better job of making a mess than cleaning one up. But I was home alone, and she shouldn't have left me unsupervised. <laughs> so I go to the office, and I start organizing and moving things around. And then I somehow end up in the closet, and I had placed some clothes on the floor instead of the hamper. And, and then my stomach started growling, and I realized I never ate breakfast. So I made a bowl of cereal, but I kind of like my cereal soft. So I set it down, and I started cleaning again. And I, I don't know what project I ended up on, but I remember sitting down and thinking, I feel like I'm forgetting something. And let me just tell you that the window between soft and soggy cereal is very small. And so by the time I realized what I had forgot, my breakfast became significantly less enjoyable. Now, I didn't do anything inherently wrong. There was nothing wrong with cleaning, nothing wrong with organizing. There was nothing wrong with making a bowl of cereal. But when I had all this stuff going on at the same time, it was easy to forget something that seemed so simple because my stomach told me, you're hungry. But the distractions of small, menial, insignificant tasks pulled me away from the primary purpose of feeding my body. And yet how often do we allow our soul's hunger pains, 
for the things of God to continue to growl as we allow a world full of distractions to override the feed me cry of our hearts. Often the things that we're caught up in aren't wrong. There's nothing wrong, Brother Bobby, with going to a practice. There's nothing wrong with going and grabbing coffee with a friend. There's nothing wrong with wholesome entertainment with your family. What is wrong is that these are often done to the very neglect of the thing that should take priority in our lives. And that's the hunger for the things of God. But in a world whose value systems put all other activities above the things of God. Let the church never be guilty of forgetting that our relationship with Jesus Christ is the number one priority. Sure, I can go to the mall. I can go to ball games. I can go to recitals. I can enjoy life. But first, I don't want to forget the one who hung and died to redeem my soul. First, I don't want to forget to put on the whole armor of God before I walk outside. Ephesians 6, 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. That means you have to be intentional about putting it on because if you don't put it on, it won't be there. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Before I ever step foot out in a world and encounter the wickedness of the enemy, I want to remember I'm in a spiritual battle. And so that's why sometimes it's not just a personality conflict with your boss, but there's a spiritual battle going on. Sometimes it's more than just a difficult relationship with your family, but there's a spiritual battle going on. Because I know we're not up against people, but we're fighting principalities. And I don't ever want to walk into a battle without first remembering to equip myself with the whole armor of Jesus Christ that is made available to me. Amen. So we get into our, our psalm, Psalm 106 tonight. and It's actually one commentator labels it a hallelujah hymn. Because its introduction is just filled with thankfulness. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. But this opening introduction of the thankfulness of God transitions into a detailed description of all the shortcomings the nation of Israel was guilty of. It starts with unbelief. Verse 7, the psalmist introduces the parallels between current Israel and ancient Israel. He says, We're, we both have sinned. We both committed iniquity. We both have wickedness. He goes on to write about their fathers, meaning the generation which God delivered from the hand of Egypt. He says, our fathers, when they were in Egypt, they did not consider wondrous works. They did not remember. Everybody say they forgot. The abundance of your steadfast love. But they rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. I find it interesting that this psalm describes the Red Sea first in terms of unbelief. Because the Red Sea, in my mind, has always been a miraculous moment. A story of faith. Where God does the impossible for his chosen people. Making an entire sea part and even allowing them to cross on dry land. But in this psalm, this moment is described by their rebellion at the Red Sea. The Bible said that when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses... Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Think about that. Despite all the plagues they witnessed, 
Israel doubted the Lord's ability to fully deliver them from the hand of the enemy. Centuries later, the Red Sea was now being described first by rebellion, first by unbelief. But here's the problem with unbelief. It's just the starting point. Because then we move from unbelief to discontentment. They progressed from unbelief. They they were no longer satisfied with what God had done or what God was doing. Verse 13, they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. This is just a brief description of the ungrateful attitude of God's chosen people displayed in the wilderness. Because their demands for a comfortable pilgrimage can be found in Numbers 11. It says, now the rabble that was among them, had a, they had a strong craving. Everybody say a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. They start remembering the things they had in Egypt. In verse 6 they said, but now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. If we recall back in Exodus 16, the fact that they even had manna to begin with was a testament to the faithfulness of God. Exodus 16 records it. For the sake of time, I won't, I won't read it all. But, but manna, bread from heaven, rained down. And they woke up and they were so surprised at the provision. But this wasn't just a one-time of occurrence. This was something they had the opportunity to collect day after day, six days out of the week. Scripture tells us that this was a test to ensure that Israel followed God's command of daily collection because it was meant to establish a daily dependence on the Lord. And the name of this heavenly bread speaks to the surprise and amazement of encountering their miraculous food because manna is said to come from the Hebrew question, man who, which means what is it or simply what's that? I picture the initial labor of this Label of this as a joyful surprise. What is that? What? What's that? We were starving to death. And now bread rained from heaven. The provision of God exists in the wilderness. In the moment of crisis. How many is thankful you know God can provide for you in the wilderness? When there doesn't seem to be a way. He can rain bread from heaven. May not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. I didn't know what the test results came back, and the doctor said there was nothing that can be done. But the hand of God showed up in my life. Somebody's got a testimony. I didn't know how I was going to get groceries for my family, but I got this check in the mail, and I wasn't expecting it. I didn't know if my marriage would last another month, but peace and reconciliation. I'm looking for somebody who has a testimony that you know in the middle of your wilderness, God can rain down manna from heaven God's going to provide in your wilderness ways you don't even comprehend yet the only thing you're going to be able to say when he does is what is this what is this but here's the tragedy because somewhere along the way Israel allowed the miraculous to become mundane Instead of excitedly saying, what is this? They sarcastically said, what is this? He said the same thing. It was still called manna. But they went from appreciating God's provision to looking down on it. Verse 14 said, but they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Another translation says, in the wilderness... Their desires ran wild, testing God's patience. And here lies the 21st century application. They allowed their lust to cause them to forget what God was doing. Instead, they focused on what he wasn't. Their focus shifted on what they wanted instead of remembering that God was providing exactly what they needed. 
in the miracle bread from heaven, what Psalm 78 calls angel's food, suddenly became a reminder of what God wasn't doing instead of a monument to what God was doing. May we never get to a place in our lives where our desires, our lusts, and cravings become so out of control that we look at the manna God gives us with disdain and discontentment because there was once a time, hear me tonight, that you were begging for what you now take for granted. <laughs> then comes jealousy, that treacherous pit of jealousy. Amazingly, the writer of this psalm found it necessary, necessary to recall the unfortunate incident of a failed re revolt. Numbers 16 talks about Korah, who came against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And here's what he says in Numbers 16.3. He says, You have gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you... Exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord. Notice the indictment. He says, the people are already holy. We're holy. What gives you the right to lead the way? See, when a jealous spirit arrives, you start thinking you can do a better job than the leader. That's what happened here. Start saying things like, I, I got the same Holy Ghost they do. What, what gives you the right to be in charge and make all the decisions? And so Korah convinces some in the camp to start attacking the leadership. It just starts in small pockets and then it just expands over time because that's like a wildfire. It just doesn't stay contained when you have that jealous spirit and that division and disunity. It starts to spread. And so it says here, here's a scary part. The psalm doesn't even mention the ringleader. Korah's name ain't even worth mentioning. Numbers tells us that the earth opened up and swallowed Korah whole. But this is what the psalm mentions. It mentions those who allowed Korah to speak into their life and taint their spirit. Which means the focus was on those who allowed the jealousness of another person to get into their hearts and their minds. And that is why it is so critical that we monitor, monitor who and what has access to our hearts. I, I don't want my spirit to get tainted by somebody that's unhappy with the leadership. I don't want my thoughts to get all messed up because somebody thought they'd be a better leader. But this is what happens when we start to forget. When we forget what church is about... We start thinking it's about titles and positions. I'll just, I'll just hang out right here. When we forget what the mission of God is, we start thinking about things that don't really matter. Can I get a witness in here? And so jealousy begins to spread and it gets into the spirits and the hearts and the minds of those. And so the psalmist says that rebellion is worth mentioning all these years later. But after jealousy, here's the scary part. After jealousy comes a drawing back. Because God told them to go forward. And they said, let's go back. Numbers 14, then all the con congregation raised a loud cry. And the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall pray by, to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? Imagine how far they had fallen. To get to a place where Egyptian captivity seemed a better option than the promise of God. The problem was their expectation of God's promise was that they would in inherit the promise of God unopposed. That there would be no opposition for the promise. They weren't expecting an enemy to stand before them. Doesn't that sound familiar? We come to God... We have this false concept in our minds that all of a sudden, things are going to be perfect. We're saved now. 
Gone are the days of sickness, frustration, fear, opposition. But I believe this story gives us a modern day understanding, a reminder that there will always be an enemy that wants to intimidate you from your promise. And here's Israel's failure. They allowed the size of the enemy to cause them to forget the size of their God. The size of their enemy caused them to want to forfeit the promise of God. When the enemy stands before you and it starts intimidating you, you need to remind yourself, however you got to do it, my God is bigger than my enemy. I know that's not profound, uh, but, but there's a revelation that can come to that when you understand that whatever I'm looking against, Whatever I'm standing against, whatever my family's standing against, greater is he that is with me. Greater is he that is in me. Come on, your enemy doesn't want you to know that you've got a God that looks down and says that's not a problem. He wants you to focus on his size instead of the size of God. But in the name of Jesus, we're going to remember some things tonight. We're going to remember that God is bigger than every diagnosis. God is bigger than every division. God is bigger than depression. God is bigger than anxiety. God is bigger I wish somebody would give him a hand clap of praise if you're ready to inherit your promise here's what happens next what happens next is apostasy the Bible says in verse 28 through 31 it says they yoked themselves with Baal they offered sacrifices to the dead. It details that they demonstrate a habit of picking up on what their neighbors were doing. Because they forgot that the purpose in the wilderness. They, they forgot that they were called to move forward and inherit the promise. They settled for acting like the people they were supposed to conquer. Is it possible... That if the church loses sight of the mission and forgets why God placed us here, instead of possessing the land, instead of influencing our world and reaping the greatest harvest, we settle for living like what God brought us out of. We yoke ourselves to the value systems of the world. And much like Israel allowed Baal, we allow culture to dictate what is important and what's worthy of our worship. And I use that word worship with intention. We could allow the world to tell us what we should worship. Worship what you can have. Worship comfortable lifestyles. Worship big houses. Worship fancy cart. Worship all these things that the Bible says when it's all said and done, you can't take it with you anyways. Let's look at a story here. The Bible talks about a man by the name of Phineas. His actions, we're talking about idolatry, okay? His actions are recorded in Numbers 25. Starting in verse 6, And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family. In the sight of Moses, in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand. Everybody say, we're about to get Old Testament up in here. And went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them. The man of Israel and the woman through the belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Now to some I understand this seems extreme. But Phineas understood that this type of living would only increase with time. So he decided to drive a spear through the heart of of sin and compromise. The Midianite woman represents sin. 
in the Israelite who brought her into the camp represents compromise. And in his zeal, he drove that spear right through sin and compromise that brought calamity onto the people of God. I wonder what would happen if there were some Phineases who would rise up in this generation and say no to every ounce of sin and compromise that would try and enter our homes, enter our families, enter our churches. Here it is. It might not seem like a big deal at the time. It was just one woman. It was just one man. What's the big deal? But somebody's got to recognize that it's only a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. And it just takes a little compromise. It just takes a little ungodly entertainment. A little ungodly relationship. But tonight in the name of Jesus, we're driving some spears through. Through the heart of sin, we will not compromise. We will not tolerate it. We won't let it in our homes, in our family. I wish somebody get an attitude with the devil tonight. Uh, you need to get some backbone and say, not up in this house, not in my family, not in my marriage. Is there a boldness here tonight that we can catch hold of? The, you enemy, you breathe your last breath in my home. It ends tonight, not anymore. Give them a hand clap of praise if you're tired of the enemy messing with your stuff. There's got to be some people of God tired of letting the enemy live rent free in your home. Rent free in your mind. Meanwhile, he's telling you it's okay to turn on that junk on the TV because you're just watching a little bit of it. Just, just listen to whatever. Just turn whatever on the radio. You're bored. Don't matter that they're talking about sex and drugs and all sorts of filth. It's just a little bit. You're just listening to it while you're driving, sister. Lie. It's not a big deal. Just a little bit. It's all it takes. But Phineas said, I see what the enemy's doing, Brother Bobby. He's putting it out. He saw that one woman coming. He saw her take her to her tent. And he said, you've done it for the last time. And he grabs that spear. And he walks in. He said, I'm so sick and tired of the enemy having dominion in my home, in my camp, in my family. And he takes that spear. And he tries it through sin and compromise. And tonight, I believe that's what's going to happen in Middletown. There's some enemies getting ready to get evicted from some homes tonight in true tabernacle. Because we are sick and tired of sin and compromise ruining our homes we got to make the decision because it can come one at a time one by one one by one and we justify it because we forget in the craziness of life, that we are called to be separate and holy. Now, this is not a self-righteousness. This is not an attempt to earn our salvation. But we are called out from Egypt to inherit the promise. But what happens is we, we forget what our mission is. So instead of inheriting the promise, we look back at Egypt and say, man, that wasn't that bad. There's just a few of us tonight. We're going to preach it plain. It's not that bad. You look at the world like, ah. I mean, I guess like, I guess it was a big deal. But I mean, now that I'm looking at it and I see all these posts on Instagram and I see what my family's doing, I see what my friends are doing. It's not that big of a deal. But I'm not going back to Egypt. Because I remember what Egypt was like. I remember what captivity was like. I remember what bondage was like. So instead of saying, I'm going to go back, I'm going to say, no, I'm going forward. I'm moving forward. I'm inheriting the promise. 
I don't care who goes with me. I will inherit the promise of God. Give him a shout of praise tonight if you're thankful for the promise. All right, let's stand. I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I'm closing. Help me out tonight, Brother Milam. See, we've discussed the numerous failings by the people of God. They started with unbelief. Their unbelief turned to discontent, which led to jealousy that became backsliding and ultimately ended with apostasy. The tragedy of the Exodus narrative is that the wilderness was only meant to be a place of transition. But they allowed the time of transition to cause them to forget the promise of God. Verse 13 again of our opening text. But they soon forgot His works. Verse 21. They forgot God their Savior who had done great things in Egypt. You see, notice the progression here. It started with them forgetting what He had done in their lives. And it eventually progressed into forgetting Him altogether. But this right here is what I love so much about our God. I know it's not been very fun tonight, but it's about to get fun. As we're reminded of the goodness of God. Here's verse 44. Nevertheless. Whew, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. And for their sake. He remembered his covenant. And relented according to the abundance. Of his steadfast love. This whole message. Can be summed up in this line. Ready for it? Even when we forget. He still remembers. Even when we walk away, He is still right there willing and waiting for you to turn back. Some of you have walked into this place and you're living in verse 13 to 21. But I have come to proclaim verse 44 over your lives. Nevertheless, he looks upon your distress and he hears your cry. For your sake, he remembers. Get that in your spirit tonight. For our never-ending failure, we serve a never Nevertheless, God, nevertheless, He's still for you. Nevertheless, His grace is sufficient. Nevertheless, His mercy endures forever. Last verse right here. Isaiah 49, 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget. This is the Lord talking. He said, even the mom might forget her child, yet I will never forget you. Behold, I have ingrained you on the palm of my hands. Somebody needs to be thankful for the cross of Christ tonight. I know you've come here feeling forgotten but he said I have engraved you on the palm of my hand and when he went to the cross and that nail was driven into his flesh he proved even while we are yet sinners he's willing to die because he will never forget you this message is to remind somebody you serve a God who loves you you serve a God who is for you and he remembers you even when you feel forsaken. I'm going to open up these altars. You can come if you want to. But I wonder if there's anybody saying, Lord, I'm grateful.
grateful that you've remembered me. I'm grateful even when I forgot. Even when I forgot what you did and forgot you all together, you still remembered. Why don't we come to these altars tonight and lift up our hands in thankfulness unto Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight, oh God. We're thankful you remember us. We're thankful you love us. We're thankful your mercy is everlasting and your grace is sufficient. All across this place, hands lifted. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Your kindness leads me to Your goodness draws me to your side, and your mercy calls me to be like you. Your favor is my delight, and every day I'll awaken my and pour out a song from my heart for you are good you are good you are good and your mercy is forever 